Welcome everyone to an episode of Doc Drafts. I'm Professor Andrew Reed and with me today we have special guest filmmaker Ken Schneider. Ken, thank you for being here today. Great to be here Andrew, thank you. I am ecstatic to have Ken here because Ken is a highly established, highly renowned, award-winning filmmaker. He has been involved in documentary filmmaking for 25 years. He has made 40 plus features and has had his work featured on HBO, PBS, Al Jazeera. He has won a, a Peabody Award. He has also been uh, had an Oscar-nominated documentary as well. So uh, very happy to have somebody as renowned and as accomplished as you are today. Thank you, Andrew. It's great. It's, I'm delighted to be here. All right. So for the first question, uh, to kind of kick off this discussion, what got you into documentary filmmaking and why documentary filmmaking as opposed to other types of storytelling? You know, there were a bunch of those um, sort of... Uh, moments where my path really headed towards documentary, but it wasn't a single thing. But uh, having graduated from uh, UC Berkeley with a degree in English literature, I knew I wanted to be involved in the story. But really, to be honest, I didn't know documentary. And documentaries to me were the, the films that we used to sleep through in middle school. So I didn't know about uh, how documentaries, of, you know, certainly of today and even when I was getting into it, had strong narratives. Didn't realize that a good doc could have a, a drama equal to a good fiction film. It's you know it's not Avengers Endgame, of course, but it's, it's you know the drama of of real life of somebody having a, a quest or yearning for something, and their struggle to get there is, you know, as dramatic in a doc as it is in a scripted film. Mm -hmm. So I had a set of experiences where I saw uh, a doc film in a in a class or you know on PBS and said, wow, well this is more than I thought. And then I was invited by, I had a, a straight job working at educational TV. I was doing educational uh, videos, which I liked. And I was also doing a lot of tech work. I was, um, I mean, I was soldering cables. I was building um, recording studios. And um, these old friends of mine had said, hey, come down to LA. I was living in San Francisco at the time. Come down to LA, we'll give you free room and board. We have no money, but we have 80 hours of material of this really great, what we think is gonna be a great story. And it was a good time in my life to, you know, make that change. So I, I quit my job. I went down to L.A., lived with them for, for room and board, and sat by the side of the editor who, who crafted these 80 hours of material into a one-hour narrative. And I was smitten, completely taken by the process. I thought, oh, I see. This is how documentaries are made in the editing room. This is where the, the writing... The, the painting of the story, this is where the layering, this is where it all really goes down in documentary. Of course, you can't make a good doc with bad footage, but you can take good footage and mess it up in the editing room. Or ideally, you could take good footage and make it great in the editing room. And that's what I think happened in this film. And, and um, I went back up to San Francisco and I started to intern and volunteer until I got paying work as an editor. And actually, a slight corrective, thank you for your wonderful introduction. Most of the my 40 PBS films I have, I have been an editor on. Mm -hmm. I've directed and produced a handful of them, but my, most of my work is as an editor. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and that's where the, the heart of it is in the storytelling. Um, sometimes I've used this analogy to students. I came up with it, but I don't think it's particularly great, but I like to say it, um, that um, create, uh, editing a documentary film is like assembling a puzzle that can be put together in a variety of ways, some clearly better than others. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a good analogy. My wife, Marsha, who's also my closest collaborator, we make films together, says mm -hmm. that for her, editing is like having one of those thousand-piece jigsaw puzzles, <laughs> but all the pieces are, are, are white. <laughs> and you got to figure out how to put it together anyway. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I, I too had similar, um, I think a similar uh, perception of documentary film as the boring things we watched in school, you know, growing up that were poorly made, dry. Uh, and yet, you know, now we see this new form or new versions of documentary <clears throat> storytelling in the past, you know, 20, 30 years. I, I think in particular, just really pushing and upping the ante for drama, seeing more things filmed in the moment. And I find myself watching more nonfiction than fiction, being more excited about nonfiction work. My wife as well, who's not even like a cinephile, but she's like, man, let's, let's find a good documentary, you know? <laughs> well, there's this interesting uh, theory of, uh, of cinema with the early film theorists who said the reason cinema really grabs people in a way that other art forms don't is because the impression of reality is strongest in, in film. Uh, and part of that is because when we used to watch cinema in a you know, closed space in a dark room, we, it was a totally immersive activity. 
But the other thing is, you know, if you compare it to, say, theater or reading a novel, what you see on the screen, if you really can be immersed, especially in that dark theater experience, brings you closest to another reality than any of the other art forms. And, and documentary even more so, because a documentary is, is like, like invites you to go on a journey maybe to another country or maybe to another culture or maybe even to your own city to something you didn't really know. So a, a good doc, I think, takes you by the hand or puts its arm around you or maybe you know, grabs you by the throat and says, you know, here's a story that you think you knew. I'm going to show you a different way to think about that story or to experience that story. Absolutely. I've often, uh, I've read before, uh, documentary <coughs> filmmaking is like painting a portrait of someone, maybe as opposed to necessarily taking a picture or it being, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily reality, it's a representation of reality, and the um, artwork comes through what is shown and not shown. And that's how the uh, filmmaker creates, puts the paint on the canvas, I guess you could say. Or as Picasso said, art is the elimination of the non-essential. Yeah. So when we take, you know, 100 hours of footage and reduce it to an hour or, or 90 minutes, that inherently means that most of your really good stuff doesn't make it. And only your best stuff that you, you know you the building blocks of, of the story you want to tell, you know, make it. And the cutting room floor is, is lousy with good stories, mm -hmm. invariably. Absolutely, yeah. I've heard the phrase to kill your you have to kill your darlings." Sometimes you've heard that phrase. I have, yes. Yeah, was, there's things that are great, but a great scene, but maybe it works on its own, but not in the context of the wider film. Um, that's something that I, I encountered a lot. Editing was I'd sit and work on the scene. You know, oh, it's great, it's perfect, and then you you inevitably sit down and watch the entire cut. And you're like, I don't know. Do you, do you ever go through that where you'll watch something at, uh, at, in, a, in the entirety and feel different about what you've cut? Or you show it in front of an audience, you think you got it figured out, and then you're like, oh, they don't know, it doesn't work. Have you experienced that before? Or? Uh, do I ever experience that? Every film I experience <laughs> that. And, and you know, as one of my mentors says, you know, you're not done until you've taken your favorite scene out. So there's a certain, you know, for uh, uh, lack of a better word, a certain Zen aspect of editing is that you really have to be willing to let go of everything. And in our current film, uh, we did a, what I thought was going to be a beautiful scene that was kind of a metaphor for some of the big themes. And I, I spent a lot of time on it, and it was a, a great shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, the footage was really interesting, and I, I made a very nice cut of it. And ultimately, I took it out of the movie because for exactly what you said, it was... It was another movie. Mm -hmm. the, 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 I miss it, but the film doesn't miss it. The film didn't need that story. Absolutely. Um, and for those uh, watching and listening, I wanted to, to uh, mention this too. Uh, Ken is currently on tour promoting his film Los Hermanos, The Brothers, um, about two mu musical brothers that uh, become separated uh, geographically uh, and then try to work together but are hindered by embargo uh, laws against, against Cuba that have changed with different presidencies over time. And we're going to get in more into that film a lot and discuss that. He's, he's on the Southern Circuit tour of, of uh, independent filmmakers right now presenting this at my university where I teach University of Pikeville. And that's how he's here today. <laughs> um, let's go back to talk a little bit about starting a documentary film project. And if you want to use Los Hermanos too as an example, you know, what do you look for when you're looking for a story to make into a documentary film? What, what are you looking for? And then how do you know it's a feature? Well, so, you know, the headline for that has to be that uh, as many documentarians as you ask that question, you'll get different answers. Uh, Marsha and I, uh, we base films on our personal experiences. So what I, one thing I, I used to say in interviews is our films are autobiographical, but they're not about us. But they're about things, issues, people who have come to us who have enticed us into, you know, exploring a story. So in the case of Los Hermanos, the brothers, uh, I have a family history in Cuba that goes back to my father being a refugee there in the 1940s. And my learning about that as a child, this is before I understood anything about Cuban politics, about socialism, about U.S.-Cuba relations. It was just about a family story. So that was my first, kind of piqued my interest about, about Cuba. And then later on as a kid, I learned, well, Cuba is you know a country that's mad about baseball. Well, I'm a big baseball fan, and I played the game. So there were several points of, of uh, convergence with myself in Cuba. And then um, uh, our older son wanted to do a community service project in Cuba. Um, and that brought us closer again. So you know, it's, 
it was really personal and family circumstances which, which brought me to the island. And once there, I discovered uh, you know, a plethora of stories that I wanted to tell. So that uh, our entry into a story is usually based on personal experience. Um, now that has a, there's a trade-off in that because what I find interesting might not be what the world or PBS audiences find interesting. So what I what I've not done, which might be more practical, is to sort of look at the landscape and say, well, here's where where there is real heat in our culture, or here's where there's an important issue. I'm going to go after that and make a film. I've never done that. Um, I've always made more personal stuff, and it's been we've had challenges at some points distributing our films, but we've always been able to find the audiences for them. So how would you best describe the type of uh, stories you're interested in telling in terms of, um, I've, I've read your description on your website, but I'll let you articulate that best. How would you, what are the types of stories you're most interested in telling in the subjects? I'm stories? interested in stories where emotion precedes information. So I'm interested in stories that are heart forward. Um, and that's, I know that's a very you know, cliche and broad term. It doesn't mean I'm interested in kind of new agey stories or mm -hmm people on, you know, uh, on personal journeys necessarily, but I'm interested in stories in which the people, the characters, um, in which their quest and their desire, their yearning is foregrounded rather than um, the issues that surround the film. So I'm interested in more theme than issue. So for example, um, we made a film called Speaking in Tongues, and that was about children learning multiple languages in school. Um, and there is a lot of information and science that supports this. There's brain research, there's um, uh, the desire for various institutions like you know the military to have bilingual um, people in uh, bilingual soldiers and diplomats. And um, our interest, while we mentioned those things, that, that was in the deep background, our interest in what is the experience of a child who learns, say, English and Chinese in school. How does that affect his or her family and family culture? So we spent time with each of our, um, our characters in their homes. And going home with someone is a key part of our filmmaking because that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's where you, know, you and your family are contending with your life decisions, benefiting from or challenged by. So that's one example of where we're interested in the kind of emotional arc of, of a story rather than the, than the intellectual and um, you know, issue-based arc. Have you found yourself living with your subjects any at all, or do you always stay separately? Um, I'm curious about that and that, the effect that that can have on the filmmaking, positive or negative. Well, that's interesting. So, you know, in, in, in a kind of pre-interview discussion, you mentioned, you know, how you would make a film about somebody, say, who lived alone in the woods. Um, and a friend of mine did make a film about someone who lived alone in the woods, actually in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, I think in most cases, and that's one case where you would want to live close to the person just logistically. Mm -hmm. In most cases, um, I wouldn't, I've not lived, in all cases, I've never lived with the people I'm making the film about. Mm -hmm. um, but it raises a bigger question of, of access. How do you access someone's story? How do you access their, their emotional arc? Um, so it's not as much about living with them as it is about building trust and spending time with them. Absolutely. So it's spending time with, out the camera, you know. For some, in some cases, you're going out, you know, uh, to see live music or going to, to uh, you know, uh, a late night, you know, beer at a pub. In some cases, it's long walks in the park or on the beach to get to know each other. In some cases, you're talking about literature and art you love. In some cases, you're going to a ball game. Mm -hmm. But spending time with people without the camera is is key. So when we go to Cuba and we have a shoot, let's say we have a, we're there for you know ten days and. Um, I'll try to arrange to be with the, the subjects of our film for as much that 10 days as we can, whether or not we're filming. Um, and if they ask us you know, not to, if they say, well, this is like a private family event or a birthday party, we'd rather not have the camera there, we say, fine. You know, our, our arrangement with our subjects is whenever you want us to stop filming, we will stop. So if there's a conversation where you know, they want to say something they don't want to be recorded, They'll usually look at me and say, "Okay, please turn the camera off," and we will honor that. That's part of our agreement. Mm -hmm. That's that's a good a good motto to have. I've done a similar thing, and we were talking about uh, who gets final sound cuts. We'll get into that later. Um, as documentary filmmakers, you know, we're trying to, our best to capture reality, to share 
truth uh, with uh, people that may not have experienced life with, as our subjects have. You know, let's put the, them in the shoes of someone else. And, and there's a lot of controversy over the years, obviously, about what's the best way to do that? What is the best style, the best mode of representation? Who should be making the films about such and such? Could an outsider ever make a film about someone else? You know, uh, in what cases is it okay for the filmmaker to be involved in the film and, and be in the film? You know, is, it, is that ever okay? And, and why would they? Um, so I'm interested for you to maybe share a little bit about um, your philosophy towards production styles, um, however much or however little you want to in certain areas, but you know, what are, what are some, how do you like to best approach making a documentary film? What's, how would you describe your style, uh, philosophy, um, any, anything in that area that you'd like to discuss? Well, you've touched upon two of the major issues, at least mm -hmm. in documentary or really in many art forms. First is what is truth? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and philosophers have been, you know, writing about this, you know, since, since Plato and before, what is the nature of truth? and is my truth and your truth? What happens if we have different truths? You know, we see that, um, you know, in the way we discuss politics. Yeah. We see that in the way we discuss, you know, the Oscars last week. Yeah, yeah. Um, we see that in the way we, we agonize over our sports team, you know, getting robbed of a championship. So mm -hmm. um, I do, I have chosen the cinema verite style as a way to get out a certain truth mm -hmm. because I feel like when your commitment is to record real life as it unfolds in front of the camera, doing as little sort of instructive direction as possible, I think there's a truth to that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, in the fiction filmmaking, the director creates an, a universe over which they have absolute control, mm -hmm. right? If I'm directing you, it's like, okay, Andrew, come in that door, you know, stand in front of the light, hit your mark, look around, consider the meaning of life, and then take four more steps and sit down in the chair, and then pick up one of these balls and, and juggle it, and then, you know, and I can create this whole alternative reality which um, I then exercise total control over. Mm -hmm. In documentary, I go into an environment over which I have no control. Mm -hmm. So if I miss that shot of you come to the door, I missed it. I'm not gonna ask you to repeat that action mm -hmm. because I think that would interfere with the truth and it might make you self-conscious. Mm -hmm. um, I might be able to do something a little more deceptive, which is take a door opening um, from a different day. Yeah. Or I might just add a sound effect of a door opening and closing and have a shot of the outside of the building. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, I could get that from a sound effects library. So I can create that artifice without, I think, violating my sort of tenets of what is and isn't truth. It's still representative of, of what happened. Of, the of reality, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's not outside of that, even though it, I didn't capture that moment. So in the editing room and documentary, we're doing that kind of thing all the time. Yeah. The other uh, issue which is really important these days is representation, and especially with our national reckoning over race and inclusion and diversity, um, there's, you know, funders now and broadcasters and festival programmers are really focusing, they're trying to center their programming on having stories told by people from within the communities they're documenting. So rather than have, you know, someone like myself make a film about uh, disability, they want a filmmaker with a disability to make that film. You know, translate that to, to uh, LGBT stories, mm -hmm. to race. And, and you know, the positive of that is that we are expanding the core of filmmakers. And because of that, we're expanding the voices of filmmakers uh, of, of in American documentary. And mm -hmm. worldwide, I think other countries are also looking at this. And, um, and I think that's been really valuable. I mean, it's also, you know, it, it's a course correction mm -hmm. because uh, there's a, a, a growing feeling that people from the outside don't actually speak the language necessarily to understand disability or, or to understand the experience of being African-American in urban America if you're not from that community. Or, um, and that said, there's nuance. I mean, uh, you know, Marsh and I are, you know, Caucasian American filmmakers and Los Hermanos Brothers is about two Afro-Cuban brothers mm -hmm. and their families. Um, you know, so do I have the right to make that film? Um, you know, we were funded to make it by PBS, so someone thought we did. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a Spanish speaker. Cuba is part of my life story. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I may think that it's an interesting dialogue to have about who has the right to tell whose story. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, given the, the race politics of the day, if I do make another documentary, it will, it will be closer to my own experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think a lot of times it's like, okay, could the film have been better if it was made from such and such perspective? And that may be true, but it's some, some, in some cases, you know, really the question should be, are we better off with, that, with this film or without it? Because in some cases that story may not be told unless someone outside of the group is the person that tells it. Uh, you know, so yeah, I, I, I see both sides of this issue clearly. And, well, and there's you know, also, and you know, there's a lot of ink being spilled on these issues mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. There is some value to the outsider gaze. Mm -hmm. They're certainly important to have the insider gaze too. I mean, there's specific issues that only a person with disabilities mm -hmm. can understand, or that only you know an, uh, a person who's mm -hmm. gay or lesbian can understand. That only an African American, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that does set up sort of an, a, an imperfect, um, you know, situation where we can only make films about ourselves, our own. And what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Does that mean I can only make films about you know middle class Jewish Americans who grew up in California? Can, can you know, very how, limiting when taken how to far a full outside extent. of my my home mm -hmm. can I go with my camera? Yes. yes. So I, I think that this course correction has been necessary. We can debate whether or not we've overcorrected, mm -hmm. but I also want to just put out there that that this discussion has really diversified and um, and brought up a generation of filmmakers who traditionally didn't have access. I mean, no Absolutely. one no one thought people with disabilities could make a film about themselves or about anyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, our colleague Jim Lebrecht just made a film called Crip Camp, which tells the history of um, of people with disabilities centered around a summer camp in the in the mm -hmm. Catskills in New York. And it's a wonderful film, it's a wonderful history which no one else knew. And that film wasn't ever gonna get made if Jim didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm positive about this dialogue we're having, even though it imposes some challenges on, on some of us. Absolutely, it, it is intriguing. Uh, you know, I, I kind of lean towards probably somewhere in the middle ground. Um, you know, because I think, and I think each project is its own question too. You have to kind of look at, at each particular situation to, and determine what's right for you as the filmmaker, you for the group of people that are, uh, that the film could potentially be about. Um, I see a lot of gray, um, and I think that makes things always more intellectually engaging and interesting. Um, and speaking of gray area, let's talk a little bit about when it comes to telling a story that May, not necessarily as controversial, but it's about a topic maybe that people have strong feelings about or have preconceived notions about. And in, you know, in Los Hermanos, um, the backdrop of the film, and it also as you've described it, kind of the spine that connects the narrative, um, is the changing laws regarding travel to and from Cuba from the U.S. and how this impacts the relationship of the brothers. And so there's a political aspect to this film, and I'm sure that with your film you wanted to enlighten and inform people uh, the impacts these laws have, but without beating people over the head of you need to vote this way or that way, and I agree with that stance. Can you talk a little bit about your philosophy towards trying to tell and tell someone's story in such a way to enlighten someone without making them feel like they're experiencing propaganda or creating propaganda? How do you do that? What advice would you give students who maybe that's what they think they want to do? I want to make a movie to change people's views about this topic or this topic. You know, how do you approach this? What advice would you give to a, an up-and-coming filmmaker that's getting into a political film, maybe, or something that is controversial? Yeah, that's a very important discussion to have. And, you know, because of where we are right now with sort of polarization of politics in America, it's really hard not to offend someone. So, for example, uh, you know, our Cuba films do not center politics. They center the arts and culture. Mm -hmm. um, However, uh, your typical Miami Cuban would look at our films and say, oh, you're being soft on Castro, or you're being soft on communism, or you're being, you know, you're supporting a dictator or something. So, you know, I, I didn't want to make that political film. I, I think about it deeply, and I've talked to many of my Cuban friends about such things, and I, I have strong opinions about such things. Mm -hmm. But as I, you know, keep mentioning, my our work is, is heart forward, it's mm -hmm. emotional, arc forward, mm -hmm. and the political issues are, are in the background to inform the arts. Absolutely. I mean, for example, in the case of Cuba, had our two brothers been um, Bulgarian, 
or from or Ghanaian or uh, Paraguayan, um, there would have been a, a good story there, but you wouldn't have had the drama of the inability to travel because you know, the U.S. doesn't have embargoes or sanctions on those other countries. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have to deal with the U.S. embargo of Cuba. We have to deal with the fact that these two countries don't get along. They don't support each other's politics. They totally disagree. They're, they're basically adversarial mm -hmm. nations. But that was not going to be the foreground. Um, so that's one way sort of to deal with this quandary. You know, how do you make a film about controversial topics mm -hmm. uh, without, uh, w you know, doing the least amount of offense <laughs> to the least amount of people you can, if that's even possible? Mm -hmm. So one is that we, we didn't want to make that treatise, political treatise, in our film. We only wanted to use the information to inform the film. So if you notice in our film, we have uh, uh, you know, a montage of U.S. presidents who speak the U.S. policy on Cuba going back to 1960 to Richard Nixon, who was the then vice president. And Nixon and Reagan and Bush and Clinton, so Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, uh, liberals, they all supported the U.S. embargo of Cuba. So you get that sense that this is part of the landscape of our story, mm -hmm. but we are trying not to pass judgment on it. And because we have Bill Clinton in there and yeah. Ronald Reagan, no one can accuse us of being partisan. Absolutely. I think that was important, and I, that hit home with me. And also, too, just as a side note, I feel just as your film, I think, handles things reasonably, and I saw things that were critical of Cuba in the film that you let the uh, one brother speak where he was talking critically of Cuba, but then the other brother say positive things. And I, I liked that. I felt it was, well, it was reasonable. And you yourself, in our private conversations, I think have been very rational and reasonable about the complexities of these issues, as a side note to the viewers at home. Because <laughs> this is well, a very political time, but you can continue on. I'm sorry. No, for your you're absolutely yeah, yeah. right. And the thing yeah. is, so, you know, the other thing that Marsha and I, Marsha Jarmel is my mm -hmm. co-producer, co-director, my life partner. Um, one thing we talked a lot about was um, we wanted to avoid the tropes, yeah. you know, the common um, images uh, of Cuba that, uh, that appears in films and in pop culture and our media. So in other words, we weren't going to have, you know, old American cars. I mean, if they're in the background, they're in the background. But we, were, we weren't going to have, you know, there's there's a shot in every Cuban film or every American film on Cuba about some, you know, senior lady dressed in white because she's a Santeria, which is a an African-based religion, and smoking a big fat cigar. We weren't going to have that shot. We weren't going to have all the, you know, the eight shots that start every montage of every Cuba scene, mm -hmm. whether it's Fast and Furious 8, which was shot in Havana, or whether it's a documentary. We weren't going to do that. We weren't interested in that. We were interested in a broader sense of Cuba. And we weren't going to tell a story about people jumping on rafts to escape. And we weren't going to tell a story about two brothers, one here, one there, who hate each other, because that's not our story. You know, uh, uh, our two brothers, one of whom lives in Havana, one in New York, they, they love their own countries. They love each other's country, and they love each other. So Aldo, who lives in Havana, loves coming to the US. He comes to the US. You know, in Cuba, he doesn't have great pianos. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have great, they don't have a lot of resources there, and it's really expensive to repair pianos, and, and, and because of the climate, um, the climate there is tough on the wood, mm -hmm. and you know, they're tuning their pianos all the time, and it, he can't afford to actually get it repaired. Mm -hmm. He can't afford to send it back to Steinway in New York, where they would repair the board. You know, it's just, there's no way, and there's also no way to ship back and forth. Um, so he comes to the States, and at any community college where he performs, there's a nine-foot Steinway, and it's tuned, and it's beautiful, and it sounds great. It's a great instrument. He's aware of that. Aldo is aware of how much more resources there are here than there. Mm -hmm. But he has no intention of leaving the island. So mm -hmm. there's so much more nuance than what we, than what we learn in pop culture. So mm -hmm. you know, back to your earlier question, you know, what's our approach to documentary? Well, our approach is that, you know, that we are not very well informed about about the world. We meaning Americans, and maybe that's true for everyone around the mm -hmm. world. But yeah, certainly, yeah. you know, there's much that we we don't know. So we, in our films, are trying to tell kind of a um, a broader version of a story than what you think you already know. And I can I can agree with that absolutely. Um, so that's that that's one aspect of uh, and and take me back to your question too. I think uh, there's one more aspect of it. Um, well, that, that's fine. I can't even remember what it was, but okay. we can move on uh, talking about a little bit about how that the Los Hermanos film started, how you first uh, met Aldo, and then figured out the framework 
for the larger film. I don't think we've touched on that as heavily. We've mentioned it, but can you talk us uh, talk about the origins of Los Hermanos? Yeah, so it, it's actually a good story. It's a good story for your your filmmaker audience to yes. to know because where we started and where we ended was a journey in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we started was I was presenting a previous uh, Cuba-themed film at the Havana Film Festival. And, um, you know, once you sort of get on a, on a journey with a, you know, with a community or a country, you know, you, you just don't know where it's going to take you. But it can take you to all sorts of interesting and wonderful and sometimes challenging places. In this case, um, I, uh, I was presenting this film and some Cuban friends of mine invited me while I was there with the film at the film festival invited me to see a piano, a pianist they described as a young up-and-coming pianist. And, you know, when your Cuban friends say, come see a concert with me, you know, you, you drop everything and go because the, I love Cuban music. And, um, and I didn't know the Cuban classical music. I, I only knew Cuban pop, you know, um, the kind of stuff that's in that film, Buena Vista Social Club. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that kind of music. I knew Cuban jazz. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the Cuban classical tradition or even that it existed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to see this pianist who, you know, turned out to be Aldo. He's this kind of, you know, wild-haired, 30-something pianist who just tore up the keys. I mean, I, I loved the show. I met him afterwards, introduced myself, told him, you know, I didn't even, didn't even talk about myself as a filmmaker, but we have some common friends, both in Cuba and here in the States. And um, I came home and I told Marsha about, about this great pianist, and she said, well, great. We're not concert filmmakers, so what's your story here if you want to make that movie? And of course, I didn't have the answer. Um, but then we, uh, I was thinking of maybe developing a series about six Cuban artists in six different disciplines at a time of this transition. Because uh, President Obama had just loosened the restrictions between the US and Cuba, and President Raul Castro, you know, Fidel's younger brother who had become president, then also started kind of, you know, making some structural changes in the way things are done in Cuba. So it seemed like it was a transition both in our relationship with Cuba and in, the, in Cuba itself. And I thought, well, let's look at the arts as a lens onto this change. So we started to develop a, uh, a series where there would be one about a photographer, one episode about a musician, which I hoped would be Aldo, mm -hmm. one about an a, a experimental artist. I found a guy who was doing great neon work maybe an actor, and I started developing these ideas, and I made one film about a photographer who uh, was the only Cuban photographer allowed to film the Rolling Stones concert in uh, Cuba, which was like this week-long you know, extravaganza where the Stones and their people bought literally 65 freight containers full of stuff because Cuba lacked the infrastructure to have big screens and lights and everything. So, so my, our friend photographed that. I made a film about that called I noticed that on It's Only show. Rock and Roll. Yeah. Made a film about a dancer. And then Aldo was going to be the third film. And then um, we found out that he had a brother in the States and we met the brother. We met Ilmar for, for breakfast one day in New York when we were presenting another film and we were very taken by him. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was, it was, real instant karma between us. We had great, uh, great, um, you know, connectivity. Mm -hmm. And then he said, at the end of brunch, he said, well, you know, Aldo's coming to play with my string quartet, right? And we said, no, we didn't know that. Because, of course, this had been impossible until five minutes earlier. Mm -hmm. It only became possible when Obama and Raul Castro opened things up. Because travel, cultural exchange had been not impossible, but very difficult and very expensive, particularly for Cubans. So Marsh and I looked at each other after that brunch and said, you know, I don't know what the story is, but there's a story here. You know, Aldo, seeing America through Aldo's eyes and then maybe following Ilmar back to Cuba and seeing Cuba through, through American, Cuban-American eyes, we thought, mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, you know, put the politics in the front. We have the family there, the two brothers separated and then coming together for the first time in many years to create together, to perform together. And we thought, well, there's, there's a drama. Mm -hmm. There's a story. And of course, what we didn't know, I mean, so anyway, uh, I, I want to say to your filmmaker audience, you know, you get on the train that feels like a good journey, follow it. You don't know where it's going to take you. Yep. Unlike fiction film where you could write the ending, we had mm -hmm. no idea. And it seemed like we're going to be documenting this moment where things are improving. We had no idea at the time that 18 months later that President Trump would be elected and then would, would slam shut the door that Obama had opened. 
Now, as it turned out, that was a very harsh decision for Cubans. They, they've suffered greatly since then. But it was, a really, it was really good for our film because it added a layer of drama which, um, which we could not have created. And I, I don't mean to say that cynically, but that is the reality. Mm -hmm. Remember, as I said, you know, the commitment is to, is to being present with the camera as reality rolls in front of your lens. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened because when you make the film, when you spend long enough on the film, you know, events, political events, mm -hmm. hurricanes, um, elections can affect your story. Absolutely. I like the analogy of if you if you come across a train going maybe to a, you know an interesting destination or you want to get on, get on it, even though if you don't know exactly where that is. And Jump that train. I like that. I, I've used an analogy too, like if uh, if you're going to start a feature doc, you know maybe you have an idea of where it could go. And I've almost kind of likened it to a summer road trip where you think you're going to get to this destination, but hey, you may take some detours. You may go somewhere totally different, and that's fine. I've used that analogy a little bit too, just because a feature doc is such a big endeavor. And you know you yourself mentioned you know your wife didn't know if the story was there until they found out about this other brother in this context, you know, so, you know, before then it wasn't going to be a feature, as, as, you know, because you just didn't feel like the spine of the story was there enough to drive people to invest. That's, that's you know? exactly yeah. right. And when we were developing the series, we were talking about six half hours. So mm -hmm. we thought that this story of Aldo and Ilmar would be, you know, a half hour, you know, mm -hmm. 25 minutes or something. And, um, and then once we started following them, uh, once we followed Aldo coming here and we, we followed them on tour, we thought, oh, this, the music is wonderful and the two brothers on screen are terrific. Maybe there's actually more of a story here. But it took us a while to feel like we had a feature. And we were actually, when PBS finally funded us for the, the show, they only funded us for 60 minutes. And we had to advocate to make this a 90-minute piece. And, you know, eventually they, they saw what we had and they, they were on board with it. But, you know, again, you know, we started at a very different place than, than the place where we ended. Absolutely. Besides the unexpected changes with uh, travel loss between Cuba and U.S. after the Trump uh, election, um, what other major changes in the narrative uh, or unexpected things maybe happened in the narrative? And how did the film change in the edit room? Was it drastically different in the early cut versus the final cut? In what ways? You know, what made you change things? So that's something we try to talk a lot about in doc drafts is the importance of trying to make something as it good as it can be, but without, you know, burning yourself out to where you reach that uh, point where um, uh, the, you get into the law of diminishing returns, mm -hmm. where it's like something is maybe 99% as it, good as it can be, but you spend 100 hours on it. You could spend 100 more hours and make it 1% better, but it's probably not worth your time. Like, can you talk a little bit about how the film changed? Uh, at what point did you decide, okay, I'm done, this is as, probably as good as it can be? Um, how did okay. that go? Well, you first, know? let me address the first thing, which is what are the external factors which, yeah. which influence the film? And really, the the election of 2016 was the main thing, um, and we and the Cubans did not know how that was going to affect them. Um, although, within the first few months, President Trump uh, undid what Obama had done, and he undid it with a vengeance. So the screws were tightened on the U.S. embargo of Cuba, which meant that um, not only was it hard for Aldo and Ilmar, to, well, for Aldo to, to, to travel, to tour with Ilmar, but um, the U.S. cruise ships uh, were no longer allowed to, uh, to go to Cuba. Uh, the airlines, you know, there were eight airlines which were, had done, uh, had added Havana to their routes, and they all um, stopped travel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Cuba is a poor country. Mm -hmm. It's a poor Caribbean country, um, and tourism is one of the economic engines. So, when the the restrictions were re, you know, re implemented, um, Cuba's economy suffered terribly. So that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, I still went to Cuba during that time, but you know there were more there were more food lines, there were more complaints, there was more discontent. So that of course affects everything. Um, the next question um, is sort of a, a bigger one about how do things evolve really in the making of the film and in the editing room. And the reality is, you know, we knew. We, there was going to be some drama in the story, and we knew, of course, we had great music, and we were going to film every performance we could, and we were going to film every kind of family interaction that made sense to do, you know, whether it's cooking dinner together or the two brothers going to the market, um, which would allow us to talk about food in Cuba, which is one place where Cuba is um, struggles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, broadly, let me say one thing that drew us to Cuba is that um, things which really work very well here don't work so well in Cuba, like infrastructure, 
um, for example, uh, food. Things which uh, we struggle with here in the States sometimes work really well down there. Um, they have a great culture around art and sport. Mm -hmm. Um, and healthcare mm -hmm. and education, you know, 99% literacy. Um, so it's, again, there's nuance. Absolutely. You know, people say to me, well, you know, which place do you like better? I mean, I can never answer that, yeah. uh, you know. Um, but I can say that there's, that, that we should have a more measured, thoughtful discussion than the one we're having. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, what happens with this, how the story evolves during the making of the film, you know, incredibly. Um, the final cut, it usually takes me about 40 versions until I can say, okay, I'm done. And I get to that point where, like you said, I don't want to spend all summer elevating this, you know, film 1%. I, yeah, yeah. I sort of, you know how they, like, like you know how athletes say, I, I left it all in the field. Yeah. I felt like I left I, it in the editing know, room, yeah. When, when you get to the point where I, I left it all in the editing room, you know, then I'm, I'm done. Then I, I call my, my color grader and the sound mixer and start scheduling, you know, um, the finishing tasks. Mm -hmm. um, but it, ch I mean, a couple of major changes happened in the editing room. There's, of course, the elimination of the non-essential. There's taking out my favorite scenes. There's, there's that pain, you know, cutting out my, yeah. um, you know, my unnecessary organs, you know, yep. cutting out my appendix, so to speak. Yep. <laughs> um, which I did need, apparently, at one point, you know, many generations ago, to eat raw meat the appendix, but you know, we, we don't need it anymore than that we cut out that scene, right? Oh, yeah. um, uh, so we did do a big switcheroo, um, which probably I shouldn't admit publicly, but... Um, okay, good, I'm among friends here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there are two sections of the film which play uh, sort of uh, opposite to their real life chronology. Okay. So that's why, you know, when I talk about reality, um, it is... Uh, it is with a, um, a qualification, with an asterisk. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe anything in the film is untrue, but whenever you add, say, a musical score to a film, you are creating something that only exists in cinema. It Correct. didn't actually exist on the street that day. And the drama, the dramatic arc of the film demanded that we kind of move these two sections, that we reverse these two sections from their, their actual chronology. And once we did that, it came together easier. So, for example, you know, the, the, the musical performances are not also in perfect chronology because mm -hmm. they, there is a dramatic arc which we need. I yep. mean, the, the July 4th performance when every, the whole, everybody's in black and white. I was like, I bet that's I mean, the one they moved to the end. Everybody's in red, white, and blue. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we had to play yeah. around with that yeah. um, because it, 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 it has a climactic aspect. It does, absolutely. And we tried to play it earlier in the film, and it, you know, it messed up with the rhythm of the, of the story because you mm -hmm. felt like, okay, we're coming to an end, but no, you're only at minute 50. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that jockeying around that takes place in the editing room. Um, uh, you know, I think for me as an editor, what, what, what takes a long time to get is, the, is what I call structure, which is the order of scenes. Absolutely. You know, the, the, uh, you know, trying to balance the emotional arc versus the intellectual arc, where to place the politics, oh, yeah. where to place the, dr the dramatic moments. Now there's, you know, there's guidelines. If you're doing a three-act structure, you kind of know at the end of act two, battle lines are drawn, sabers are out, and you know, the world's about to end. And then act three is uh, a resolution. But it's not always that pat mm -hmm. in a documentary where you, where you control it. Well, yeah, where you don't have control <laughs> of what you, you know, you, you have control about when you show up on the camera, but not what's appearing in front yeah. of the camera. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I spent a lot of time on structure, you know, putting the pieces in order before I actually internally cut the scenes. So, you know, an assembly, an assembled version of the film might be two or three hours for mm -hmm. what will become a 90 minute film. And the scenes might be cut really fat. Yep. You know, I might have a lot of different elements in each scene um, so that I can see the possibilities of the scene w laid out in an assembly. And then once we get the pieces in a, 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 a rough order, then I can say, okay, this scene, which is early in the film, um, really needs to focus on just getting to know their relationship. But the scene that's 40 minutes later, we don't need to define their relationship because we already know it. So let's, on that scene, let's lose the backstory and go right into, you know, them rehearsing. So that process is what takes 38 or 39 or 40 versions to get to. Absolutely. Putting everything in place and then internally cutting each scene. And then, of course, adding transitions. And, and because it's a music film, 
we spent a lot of time and had a lot of discussions about how to use music. What is our approach? What's our theory of music and score in this film? And the approach we, we took was that we thought of the score as a suite, you know, as a, where each, each composition would mirror the, the emotion of the story where it appears. So, you know, some of the music is, is melancholy, some of it is yearning, some of it's triumphant. Um, that was in, incorporated in their arc. Absolutely. I really was blown away with the musical performances, found myself you know, moving along with it. Uh, I found it very peaceful and relaxing, too, and it gave me time to reflect, uh, I think, especially now in a time in, in existence where things are not so much about relaxing, but about being in constant communication and response. So I really found the film kind of a relief, honestly, a break. Uh, um, and so I enjoyed it quite a, quite a bit. I wanted to come back to uh, the editing room, uh, you know, having to remove some of your favorite scenes, and that's so challenging. And uh, I've heard different philosophies about things. Um, uh, a couple I'll share, and I'm interested in you sharing yours as well, because that's kind of a lot of what we're trying to do with this channel, with this, this show, is enlighten and inform and give new and up-and-coming filmmakers ideas. I've heard a couple of things, and this can apply to screenwriting too. I've heard um, keep, if something drives the plot forward, develops a character, or it's funny, consider leaving it in. And I noticed the scene where they're looking at, uh, one of the brothers is looking for the other one at the airport, and they can't find him. You know, that, that scene doesn't really add anything to the plot, not necessarily, not necessarily the character, but it's funny, and I like it. And so I really enjoyed that scene, but that's something that some people might just say, oh, cut that, you don't, you don't need that. But it's, it's funny, and it's a nice little breather. Um, and so I was going to just mention that. Uh, and then the um, other thing I've heard, too, in terms of getting critiques and feedback on cuts, which I'm sure is something you do, too, seeking the opinion of others that you trust, is if enough people tell you something's not working, they're probably right. But in some cases, you're probably the best person to figure out how to fix it. I've heard that, too. I don't know. Do you have any little tidbits of wisdom or philosophies around what to cut, what to keep, and mm -hmm. getting feedback from others and how that impacts your vision and yeah. anything you want to share with that? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so let, let me make the, the first thing I want to address is the comedy aspect. And, um, you know, documentaries can be quite grim, Absolutely. especially if they focus on social issues. So. I make a rule whenever I'm watching dailies, you know, camera, raw footage, raw unedited footage, mm -hmm. if anything makes me laugh, mm -hmm. I, I put, you know, three asterisks in front of it and, and you know, label it with, with red. Mm -hmm. And if anything mm -hmm. uh, makes me, you know, feel anything emotionally, if I cry, if I get a lump in my throat, I, I, I want to note it. Yeah, yeah. Because, and, and I will labor to put laughter in the films, in my films. Mm -hmm. So this one, the, the, the airport story is so, it's really interesting because, you know, we had done everything to prepare for that shoot. And what we expected was, you know, they're going to, you know, see each other from across the airport and they're going to run into each other's yeah, arms. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen you in years. How's it going? And instead, there was that sort of, you know, missed opportunity, which we played for laughs. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found a good cue, uh, yeah. one of all the songs, which helped us with that. And, um, it's very much part of the story, actually, because you're right. In terms of a plot point, it's not essential. But mm -hmm. everyone who I've talked to who sees the film remembers that. And, and they all say to me, I have been there with my sibling. Not necessarily at an airport. Yeah, but, you yeah, know, yeah, I've yeah. been in a place where they were supposed to show up and they didn't. And then I was pissed at them. Mm -hmm. And then we figured it out. So that's um, an archetypal sibling moment. So mm -hmm. for that reason, I think it was essential. Oh yeah, yeah. I get, I, I, yeah. I'm just yeah. Some people might if yeah. they're being brutal with time. Yeah, because well, yeah. that does drive the plot forward. But no, it, You're right. it does add to the larger story and the the challenges of travel and airport chaos and really how difficult it is for them to even meet each other and just finding each other. And you know, I mentioned one, at one point, you know, he says like he doesn't have a phone either. So okay. I can't imagine trying to you know have an international flight arriving without a phone. And how do I find my well? Pickup, I mean, there's, you know? there's another you know, yeah. of course, you know, Cuba. You have to have your own SIM card. You have to get the SIM card. I mean, I mm. I have Cuban phone. I've got Cuban SIM card. But at the time, you had to kind of get it at the airport. Anyway, it was a poor excuse, and Aldo kind of nailed him on it. He said, "Come on, you could have borrowed a phone." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that <laughs> um, so that's addressing uh, that one. And your your second inquiry, which is interesting, and I want to address, but I forgot it. Yeah, about uh, who, basically, when you get feedback on a cut oh, from okay. someone other okay. than yourself, got it, got it. how do you know what, what's good feedback? Okay. How do you know if their suggestion to fix it is the right one? How do you approach that? I call this the rule of thirds. Okay. And um, In a different context. <laughs> yes, right. No, yeah, it's, it's not yeah, about, know, yeah. yeah, it's not about crossing the line or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the rule of thirds is, um, 
And this is true with anybody who gives me a critique, that a third of the time they say, there's a problem here and here's the solution, and they're right. A third of the time they say, there's a problem here and here's a solution, and you, I think to myself, you have correctly identified the problem, but your solution is not correct for my movie. Mm -hmm. And a third of the time, they're wrong. About both. Uh, this is true whether it's a paid editing consultant who I pay a lot of money for or mm -hmm. whether it's one of my kids. Yeah. Um, so I, I listen to every critique. I try to you know, get out of my own way and I try to address everything, even if I don't ultimately agree. Mm -hmm. And in this film, um, I got stuck at a certain point. I could not get out of my own way, and mm -hmm. I hired an, a colleague of mine, another editor, to come in. He took the film for about six weeks. I gave him my hard drive, and oh, yeah. you know, and I went to his uh, editing studio and looked at his work every few weeks, and it was so liberating mm -hmm. to sit back and put my feet up on his couch and say, gee, that's great, Bill. You've, you've, you've solved all the problems I created for myself. And then I took the film back and finished it. Mm -hmm. So that's a great collaboration for me. It's, it's sometimes hard to edit your own material for the obvious reasons because you had, you know, maybe I had a certain emotional experience yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, on the set or on location and, mm -hmm. I, and ultimately it's, the film doesn't need that. Um, or it's, it's hard to take out your favorite scenes. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, there are times when, and, and here's another thing about that. Um, there are times when a, like a producer will say to me or a director when I'm editing someone else's film, well, you, you know, you, I want you to try this thing. And I know in my heart it's wrong. I know it's a mistake. And I'll say to them, you know, I, we can't do that for, for three reasons. And I'll just start talking on my bum here because I don't really have three reasons. And the first mm -hmm. one I'll say is you know, something small, like, you know, the color of those shots won't match. Yeah, yeah. And by the time I'm at reason three, I'm saying, you know, you know, the, well, you know, the, the, the the integrity of Western civilization hinges on whether or not we get this right. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, really clinging tightly to this thing. Mm -hmm. And then their response is, okay, do it anyway. I want you to do it. Mm -hmm. And I do it, and I was wrong. And that is a great moment in editing, because you realize you can't ever know till you put it up on the screen. Yep. yep, absolutely. And it's interesting, too, sometimes in terms of how to... When you're trying to figure out how to solve the issue, you know, as the editor, quite often, you're the most familiar with all the footage. And so you, know, you would think that you would be the best one to solve the problem. And sometimes you are, but sometimes having the, that second party to come in, that maybe it's the director, you know, who should be very familiar, obviously, with everything because they were there. You know, and and th those conversations can maybe help you find a new approach. Sometimes you can, it's easy to get stuck in a one-track mind way of thinking, like, I've got to do this, I've got to have it in this order. Sometimes that second perspective can come in. and and assist in that. So that's, that's interesting. Well, and there's even more to that than that, Andrew, is that a, a good director knows how to work with editors. Yeah, talk about that, well, your so relationship. It, with... it, you know, part of it is what you said, it says offering an external perspective, which is important. But, you know, the directors who I really like to work with in the editing room are directors who know why they're making the film. They, mm -hmm. were, they know why they showed up with the camera on that day, and they mm -hmm. know what the scene means. Mm -hmm. So if I look at the dailies and I say, you know, this looks a lot like the other scene we already cut. And, and, and if the director says, well, no, here is what's different about it, which, and something I didn't see, that's a valuable discussion to have. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'd like to look at the, um, excuse me, look at the footage with them. And, and consider what it might be about because there's not a single way to cut a scene. Mm -hmm. You know, you Absolutely. can. There, there's many ways to edit a scene, and there's, you know, what in which part of the which theme is foreground, which theme is middle ground, which theme is background. You know, what information is in there versus what emotion is in there. There's so many different ways to approach material. So I like a director who 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 understands their material deeply, and can articulate to me why it's an important scene to cut or why it isn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think things are important that the director doesn't, and then we have to dialogue about that. But I like, the, I like the director to be active in the editing room. I don't need them to be sitting next to me while I'm cutting, but I like them to be close enough to process. They look at my work at the end of the day, and then we talk about it. Absolutely. Um, kind of winding down our discussion, uh, can you talk a little bit first about um, the future of Los Hermanos in terms of what, what else you're doing with it, where you are you know, maybe working to get it distributed, and how people can watch the film right now that want to. Yeah. Um, 
So Los Hermanos, the brothers, has already had a theatrical distribution, which started last May. Uh, we launched in LA, played in about 50 or 60 cities. Sadly, much of it was virtual because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a PBS broadcast a few months ago um, in September, I believe. We um, are screening in Europe. We've been, we're in festivals. Um, so if people want to watch it now, they should go to our website. Um, can I give the URL? Yeah, yeah, so it's absolutely. hermanosbrothersfilm.info. So hermanos is spelled H-E-R-M-A-N-O-S, hermanosbrothersfilm.info. And there is a watch page there and if you do go to our site there is also a very cool listen page which will link you to music by the brothers their individual projects by their duet uh, a record a cd which they produced together mm -hmm. and also music by um, their father who is a, a conductor and composer of note in cuba and by aldo the cuban uh, brother's wife diana who also conducts uh, a nearly all-woman string orchestra. So there's a lot of opportunities to listen, to download, and to go to their own sites and purchase stuff if you want to do that. Awesome. Okay. Um, and uh, the next phase for us, we do, Marsha and I, mostly Marsha, do a lot of impact work. Mm -hmm. So after the film has had its, you know, its life as Run. a film, mm -hmm. being, being, being broadcast and exhibited, um, we make the film available to organizations and groups and individuals who are doing either activist work or community work that's related to the themes in our film. So our interest in, in impact for this story is to address the question of diversity and inclusion in classical music in the U.S. Um, I mean, you know, everyone loves music, um, but the numbers of who plays in our orchestras are, are pretty striking. There's about only about 1.7 percent of classical musicians who have orchestra seats are black. About 2.8 percent are Latino. So, uh, and then the music which is played always usually draws from the European mm -hmm. masters, mm -hmm. um, whereas there are, broad, there are deep classical traditions in Latin America, in Cuba, uh, in Africa, which rarely find their way into the repertory. So there are organizations in the states, including the Sphinx Organization in Detroit, um, who nurture the aspirations of young musicians of color to obtain classical instruments, to get training lessons, to attend conservatories, to be trained on how to comport yourself during an audition, and also to expand the notion of what is in the canon, mm -hmm. you know, what is being played. So. Organizations like Sphinx and others who are working in this, um, on these issues are using our film as a tool to, um, uh, in their efforts. So, the, you know, many classical orchestras and symphonies and conservatories are now having this discussion about diversity and inclusion and are struggling with how to do it because, you know, the typically neighborhoods where kids of color grow up, uh, the schools are not as well um, as well funded, mm -hmm. so the first thing to get funded, unfortunately, are arts and sports programs. You know the things which which are life giving, um, but they're not. Uh, they're they're deemed non essential. Yep. Um, so you know they're addressing that. They're trying to augment that, and we are delighted that our film is being used as part of this effort. So Marsha's work is to try to get the film in the hands of people who are deeply involved and committed to diversifying our classical music core. That's great. Um, going off on that, uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, other uh, projects in the pipeline, anything you want to share briefly? I'm actually editing a piece um, by my colleague, Marco Williams, who lives in Chicago. And this is a film about uh, gun violence in, uh, in African-American working class communities. This one is set in, in West Philly. And um, it centers around, I, mean, I just described the issue to you, which is a violation of everything I just said the past hour, but the film focuses on a woman who has lost several relatives, including two children, to gun violence, and she has become a committed and fervent anti-gun and anti-violence advocate in her community. And that's, that, the, the film is about her. It's called Murders That Matter. Interesting. I'll definitely have to check that out. And your website for your film company, uh, Patchworks Films, what's that site and what can we do on there? Uh, so www.patchworksfilms.net. You can take a look at 
clips from our various films. Um, you can you know read about you know read press about them, and there might be a couple of, of, of ways to get involved in mm -hmm. some of the issues that are associated with our films through our, our site as well. And as you've mentioned, you predominantly I think identify as an editor, and so uh, any uh, filmmakers out there that have a project uh, that might want to hire. Uh, uh, Ken, uh, he will consider it. He's a very, uh, uh, you, you, you feel strongly about the projects you support though, and that's, that's good, I think. So uh, the, keep that in mind. And uh, he's very accomplished, so I'm sure he's, you know, just, uh, he'll have, a, he'll have a, a rate that's fair for that, <laughs> definitely. So uh, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, Ken, for being here. I, I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I have. Um, I, I greatly appreciate that. Thanks very much. It's been great to talk. I'm, you know, uh, we could do another, we could make it a 10 part series. There's more to say. <laughs> I think so. I think so. There's always, I, I can, I can always run a, run and ramble about documentary filmmaking, especially the theoretical aspects. But um, hopefully those listening or watching at home uh, can say the same and found our conversation interesting and enlightening. If you're looking to hear more uh, from other filmmakers as we explore topics relating to the editing and shooting process of documentary film, you know, storytelling, what is truth when it comes to documentary filmmaking, be sure to like and subscribe to uh, our channel and uh, check us out for future videos in the pipeline. Be sure to check out docdrafts.com where you can find more information about what we do. Uh, I provide consulting work as well as oversee a rough cut documentary film festival where we guarantee you personalized feedback on all your submissions. So thank you very much and check us out again in the future.